I now have the uh, distinct privilege of introducing to you our keynote speaker, Lauren Manning. The life of Lauren Manning is an unforgettable lesson in the power of hope and strength. She endured catastrophic injuries and devastating loss. As a former executive and managing partner at Cantor Fitzgerald, a company that had offices in several of the top floors of the World Trade Center's North Tower. Ms. Manning fought and battled to survive the unthinkable when terror struck on September 11th. Her will to live and resolve to rebuild her life continues to resonate powerfully around the world more than a decade later. She is the author of her best-selling memoir, Unmeasured Strength, here to share with us her amazing story of courage and resilience. Please join me in giving a big San Diego welcome to Lauren Manning. Thank you, San Diego. It is wonderful to be here this morning. We are standing united in remembering those whose lives ended during the attacks of 9-11. And the men and women in uniforms, many like yourselves, who risked their lives and gave their lives to save another. The story I have to tell this morning is forever connected to their story. Ultimately, it is a calling to each of you that when life presents a true test, that when you are compelled to draw upon your own unmeasured strength, that you will find it there. An answer to the call an answer to the gravest of times and in the deepest of challenges. Let me take you to a place that so many individuals here today face every single time they answer the call of duty. On September 11th, I was heading to my office. At One World Trade Center, I worked on the 105th floor, and as I entered that North Tower that morning, I turned to the right toward the elevator banks, and I smiled at two women as I rounded the bend. And suddenly, everything moved. Imperceptibly, it felt as if the 110-story tower had imperceptibly jumped. It was a surreal feeling. It was punctuated by a loud, piercing, whistling sound. And unbeknownst to me, 90 floors above me, the first jet plane had been crashed into the building, cutting through its central core, cutting off any means of escape for anyone above that floor. The atmosphere was surreal. A second later, the jet fuel which had exploded through the elevator banks, three of which had a direct path to the lobby, came pummeling down. And a moment later, I was enveloped in flames, thousand degree heat, and everything and everyone in its path was in flames as well. The two women who had been standing there only a moment before were now lying on the floor, their bodies covered in fire. And like them, I was on fire. The blast had an amazing power and backdraft that continued to pull me into the fire. I was spun around. My voice was powerless. I could not breathe. I could not speak. I fought to get back to the doors which I had entered only moments ago against hurricane winds that had blown out the 40-foot-tall windows of the lobby, and when they eventually released, a minute later, literally threw me outside onto the sidewalk where I'd entered only moments before. The pain was unimaginable. The burns grip was crushing. A weightless force with infinite power to hold me. Everywhere was smoke and destruction. 
and I knew that my only shot was across six lanes of highway where they had recently laid a narrow strip of grass. Everything else was cement and macadam. And all I could think of as I began to run across that highway, which seemed to last forever, was my 10-month-old son, who I screamed to. I can't leave you now. I won't leave you now. I haven't had you long enough. I reached the grass, dropped and rolled, and at last was able to extinguish the flames with the help of a bond broker and a trader from Lehman Brothers who came across that field that morning to help those that had run, the few that had run out that were on fire. I heard distant sounds, glass breaking, steel wailing. The building twisted, objects came crashing to the ground. Bodies soon came crashing to the ground. And through the all-consuming pain, improbably, I looked up and I saw the second plane hit. I had been there in 93. I traveled down those stairs. And every one of us that worked in that building, building had the feeling that the, they would come back. And it was obvious at that point that they had come back. The impulse to let go became overwhelming. And in an unspeakable moment, I prayed for death because I did not even believe that death would release me from that pain. I realized that this was my moment and my choice. I could keep fighting or I could surrender and die on the side of that highway. And so I chose and I decided to live. 55 minutes after the first blast and less than 10 minutes before the South Tower fell, I finally was able to board an ambulance and leave Ground Zero. I would be conscious for another five agonizing hours until slightly after 2 p.m. that afternoon I was intubated and put into an induced coma. I had suffered an 82.5% total body burn. They calculate your odds at that point at best as being 17.5%. And by that evening when I made it up to Wild Cornell Burn Center, my odds were far less. I suffered flatlining repeatedly, near lethal infe infections, amputations, lung collapses, and a host of other challenges, many of which I will endure the rest of my life. And yet, I survived. I had refused to surrender, and I held hope when even those around who loved and cared for me logically held very little. And in late November of 2001, I would learn that 658 of my colleagues at Cantor Fitzgerald, people whom I'd worked with nearly 10 years, many who I'm known far longer, close friends, were dead. And I vowed to avenge them by not letting the terrorists get one more. I would return home more than half a year after leaving for work that morning. And what I realized upon returning home is that my work was only just beginning. I had recognized that defeats at this point were temporary and that they could become part of me without conquering who I was. And I believed that I had a stronger sense of my power to prevail than any that I would fail. And I believed I survived against all the odds because of will, because of faith, and because of love. The will to try, the faith that I could succeed, and the love that I had for my family and the team that surrounded me. I had the help of many, but nothing is going on unless you yourself believe. And you don't know how strong you are until it is truly your only option. I knew that morning 
that I was not going to die at the side of that highway. That if I could make it through the flames, that if I could extinguish them, that if I could escape that war zone, if I could take that next breath, if I could learn to breathe again, to speak again, to walk again, to move my body again, that I would live in a body that was forever changed, but it would be a life that was there for the taking. It was mine. We all experience moments of adversity, those times in our life where we feel we are at our weakest and we look back and we see that even then we had the power to choose, the power to act. And we tell ourselves, if I only knew then what I know now. But if that teaches us anything, it's understanding the true power that you have and that you needed not to have felt such doubt. The lesson is not about how strong you may have been once upon a time. It's about how strong you are right here, right now. My hands were so badly burned, they were two mitts at the end of my arms. They had wanted to amputate my left arm for a, more than a month at a time early on, and no one would believe I no one would believe that I would have any useful ability to do anything with them. I left the hospital, entering the rehab hospital, hospital with hands full of pins, amputations, and the inability to move my hand beyond this position. But slowly, over time, I was able to move my hand from here to here to here. And this fist was my pure joy. I was able to finally entwine my hand within my son's own. And this was my unmeasured strength, and it is only symbolic of all of our unmeasured strength to fight against seemingly what is insurmountable. My father, a former Marine, told me that when things happen, you weren't the first one they happened to, and there was no way to go but forward. And he crystallized that eloquent advice by saying, get over it, <laughs> which really just meant get on with it. All of us have been or will be wounded in some way, physical or psychologically. And though you may or will be touched by adversity, you can refuse to be held by it. Every day is its own milestone. Every morning you have the privilege to open your eyes. You get to decide. Will you choose the twilight of complacency? Or will you dare mighty things? Gather your courage this morning when you take those steps, those steps of commitment, those steps of leadership, those steps that will be remembered for generations to come. Remember, every day you have a choice. Make it count. Thank you. Thank you.